walked in our pain and now you're taking us higher stand and sing with us you stepped into time you lay down your life to save us you took all our shame on the cross it was laid and now you're taking us higher we come Shep, because Shep makes this real for you out there in uh, 
whatever that land is out there. So thumbs up for Shep. He's up there in the rafters. Some of you here might not even know there's a man up there. Um, but we are super, super great, grateful for him. Alex at the soundboard, who's making all these complex things uh, sound beautiful, and a wonderful bunch of musicians this morning. <laughs> Amen. So we're here to celebrate. And here's what's been on my mind as I welcome you. I was thinking, uh, I was feeling a little guilty this morning because when I think of Jesus, which I very often do, I too often um, immediately begin to think about the things I would love for Jesus to do for me. And now suddenly I'm not thinking about Jesus anymore, but I'm thinking about me. And I felt a little bit this morning like I would go into a room and there would be the hope diamond and all that would matter to me is not even looking at it, but just going, how can I benefit from this amazing, uh, priceless treasure here? And so I'm encouraging myself, I'm encouraging you. What if we just make, uh, what if we purpose to put our minds on him just for him? He is magnificent, he's beautiful, he's a priceless treasure. And we could just think about him and let it just stay that simple. And then when we praise through these songs, I think we'll find more of our hearts um, engaged, and I think he would just be really, really blessed. How do you feel about that? Okay, good.
You get the best. Uh, you deserve the best that we have. You actually command that we give you all that we are, all that we have, because until we do, Lord, you know we'll never be satisfied. We'll never be living in the fullness of who we were created to be. And so that command to give ourselves, to give our mind, to give our hearts, our souls, our bodies to you is an invitation to life and freedom and thriving. And I pray that we would practice that now, even as we declare these truths about what we believe. We love you, Lord, and we're grateful to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Lord, for rescuing us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for living in us, living through us. Thank you for saving this planet. And uh, Lord, I ask that you would speak to each person that's out on Facebook Live and out there watching and every person that's here in the room, Lord, that we would meet with you, appreciate you, uh, show our love back to you, reflect just a little bit of your goodness back and say thank you today. Uh, and I don't know what you need from the Lord. Uh, I feel like what I need from him is just to slow down, just to appreciate him a little bit, to see his face more, to feel his peace, his patience in my life right now. So just reach out and say, Lord, here's what I need from you right now. Please, make sure you say please. And Jesus, we are so grateful for you in our lives and thank you for even listening to our prayers. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen? Amen.
Would you grab a seat, everybody? And I want to talk to you out on Facebook for just a minute. So I had a picture of us in the room enjoying the Lord in worship, and some of us are having our hands out, and some of us are having our hands up, and we're singing and we're enjoying Him. And then I had a picture of some of you guys in your living room at home like this, going like, you know, the, that sounds pretty good. And it's a whole different thing. But, but here's the thing. If you are doing remote learning this morning, I want to encourage you to engage, to step towards the Lord, because the Lord doesn't really see our geography. Like he, He's not concerned that I'm here in this pew or I'm in my, uh, in my breakfast nook at home or I'm on a hike. He wants me to appreciate him and worship him for who he is. So wherever you have chosen to be, make sure that it's not an excuse to be comfy on the couch, but this is a time when you can focus on the Lord. There was only one yes. amen. There were two. Okay. So, <laughs> so anyway, I, I, just, I just felt like that was for some of you guys out there because if I was home, my, ten, my uh, tendency would be to kick back rather than to lean in. So a uh, couple of things. First of all, it is Brian King's birthday today. So happy birthday, Brian. And if, if, you're out on, if you're out on Facebook, say happy birthday, Brian, with a Y. Okay. Not happy birthday, Y, but Brian, Y. Okay. Uh, there's a ladies' lunch today happening right after the service at 12 at Dover Hendricks Park. So bring lunch and a chair and go find any other instructions, or is that good? Okay, so go hang around with the women of Caneo. So for the month of, fr of uh, February, we have been doing a uh, service project of collecting, um, and I want to thank you for uh, all of you who brought shoes last week to help some homeless people in a few camps in our area. And no matter how you feel about homelessness or the politics of it or this or that, people need shoes so they don't get sick and die of something that just doesn't even make any sense. So thank you for taking, we actually found out the sizes of all the people that needed shoes. You guys brought shoes last week. They were delivered last week to bless a whole bunch of people in our area, so thank you. And then some tarps and some big Ziploc bags and all that jazz are gonna go out this afternoon to benefit those people as well. So I just wanna say thank you mm -hmm. for being faithful and for using what you have to bless others. Good job, Kaneo. And you'll, we'll have more uh, updates next week. Nikki will be here to share some of the stories of what she sees God doing out in that population. So I want to say this also. Um, I have noticed how disconnected some members of Kaneo Church have become. So in other words, I have had questions over the last like two weeks. Are you guys meeting inside? And I was thinking like, we've been meeting inside since November. Like, it's not particularly new, and, but I, but I want to encourage, um, especially you who are out there watching, it's hard when you're doing remote learning to stay in touch. So we are doing our best job on our end to send out newsletters and the email and to put things on Facebook just to get your attention. Um, so we're putting things out on social media, but it, please access it. And also, it's, it's been a little hard to stay in touch with some of you. So, you know, we'll call or text or whatever and say hi. But please feed back. Please say, hey, I'm still alive. Hey, I am watching the service and I'm enjoying it. You know, say amen now and again because we want to know that you're alive and that you're still connected to us. And, and just know that our enemy wants to disengage each of us from each other. He wants to split apart the body of Christ. And that's a lot of what he has been doing this last year, so don't play into it. Just do your part to lean into each other, lean into the Lord, stay connected to the body. If this is your church, let us know, and please stay connected and informed. Amen. Amen. Uh, here's, here's something else. The, I feel like COVID has affected the church in America in some pretty dramatic ways. So statistically, a whole bunch of people have stepped out of church attendance, a whole bunch of people have switched churches. There's been a lot of shuffling and movement and et cetera. But moving forward, the churches that will survive are the ones that are relationally connected 
and where the people are very committed to each other and reaching our communities together. And, and it's not, I feel like one of the good things that happened in 2020 was the whole idea of just attending church was challenged. The whole idea of that's my church and I go every so often was really challenged. And so we, were, we, we couldn't really take that for granted anymore. And so I believe that God is inviting us and a lot of other churches to become not, not more scattered, but more connected, more deeper in relationship with one another. And here's the other thing. It helps us get ready when persecution happens, when the next pandemic happens, when next things will happen, it helps us be tough. Because I don't think we were ready for 2020. But I do want to be ready for 2022. Yep. So now is the time for us to dig into relationships. So we are doing uh, a, a discipleship process as a church. It's called Rooted. And I've wanted to do this for about three years and Finally, everybody's on board and ready to go for it with me. And this is a 10-week, go deep with the Lord, go deep with each other. Five days a week, you do some Bible study and some journaling. And then once a week, you meet with your group to talk about what you're learning. People who have been through Rooted say that it has changed their faith and deepened their faith. They've also learned a lot about themselves. Because one of the things that this does is helps you understand Jesus and what he did for you better, but it also helps you understand, are there some strongholds in my life that hold me back? Are there some things that I don't like talking about that are a deterrent? Are there some gifts in me that God wants to use? Oh, yeah, maybe you don't even know what they are. But there are two weeks in this thing where you discover your own gifts, and how do you use them to serve Jesus and, and change the planet for good? So anyway, Rooted is going to start in March. There are about 60 of us doing it so far together, which I think is phenomenal because we, we're coming out of a pandemic, right? So mentally, we're all tired. Some of us are pretty kind of depressed, like, wow. So this is a hard time to say, yeah, I'm going to go do a thing with all of you. It's hard. But I think people are realizing it's also important. I think this may be the best time for us to connect with each other and connect with the Lord in a deeper way. So we, uh, we reached out the last couple of weeks to let you know about Rooted, and uh, we have not had a lot of response on the online group, but this is interesting. A lot of you want to gather in person. I mean, just about everybody, because you miss each other. It's pretty incredible. And so a lot of groups are going to start in backyards, and then they're going to move indoors as things get safer and, and easier. Uh, we're going to have a group that's going to meet in here, I think on Wednesday night, if you want to be in the sanctuary and spread out. And that'll be with Jim and Lorene. Uh, and then we've got a group on Saturday mornings at 1030 with Ryan and Nicole, if you want one that's outside and sunny. And so that'll be starting. And um, I think that'll be some of our you know, 30-somethings, but anybody is welcome. And then uh, there are groups led by Kenny and Wendy Kappen, uh, Scott and Julie Thurman, uh, um, Julie and T.C. Foster, and Raul and Amber Benuelos. So we have a bunch of these groups starting, and I want to ask you to just pray and say, Lord, do you want me to do that? And yes, it's homework. Yes, it's commitment. And the Bible talks a lot about counting the cost. So if you want to do it, you're going to grow like crazy. If now is not the season for you to do it, just pass, and we will offer this again in the future, but we would love to have a bunch of you involved. So um, there are rooted cards that you can fill out, and then uh, also you can send an email to groups at caneochurch.com. What was that email address? Good. So all of you out there on Facebook, groups at caneochurch.com and we will get you connected, and it starts the first week of March. If you're part of a group already, you can get your books, group leaders. You can get some books today and take them with you and start giving them to your people, okay? So I want to pray just for that process, and then we are going to sing again. Uh, but Lord, I lift up these leaders. I ask, Lord, for your grace, for your power to be in them, that they would 
lead courageously, that they would have energy to do it right now. Lord, you'd fill their tanks to overflowing so that they can help others follow you. And Lord, I ask that you'd speak to people in the room, outside and online, who need to grow. And Lord, that you would help each of us to take that step in following you and to join Rooted right now if, if that is your next step for us. And Lord, I ask that you'd bless this process for Caneo Church and that we would never be the same again, that we would be deeper, that we would be stronger because we invested time with you. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the place said? Amen. Amen. How about if we uh, stand up and uh, we're going to sing a little bit more? And we're also going to take our offering at this time, I think. Is that right? Is that real? Um, as that's happening, uh, this song that we're going to sing before Kirk uh, comes right back up and um, gives us our message today uh, reminds us of the very often uh, referred to analogy in Scripture that we are sheep and that Christ is our shepherd. And so I just, uh, you can't close your eyes and, and do the offering, so don't close your eyes, but in, just see that picture of you as a sheep. We're not the smartest uh, creatures on the planet, um, pretty needy actually, but uh, abundantly supplied by our shepherd. There's nothing that we need that he isn't uh, eager and ready to give to us. He's an amazing caregiver. And so we can thrive as the sheep that we are. Um, and so this is just a beautiful song written around uh, Psalm 23.
Thank you, Lord, for being that kind of shepherd. We're frail, we're needy, uh, but we are abundantly cared for. Thank you for drawing us to yourself. Thank you for the love that's in your heart. Thank you for your attentiveness, your attention to us. There's nothing that happens that you don't see. There's no, <laughs> sometimes we cast, Lord, we just fall right over and we don't even have the legs to get ourselves up and you're right there to upright us again and keep us moving. Thank you for green pastures. Thank you for feeding us and thank you for moving us to new pastures when we've cleared that one away. You are the good, good shepherd. And you're the one, by your Holy Spirit, who will enable us to take in the word that you're about to give us through our pastor, make it part of who we are, change us from this moment forward. And for that, we say thank you in advance. And the church said, amen. Praise the Lord one more time. Beautiful morning so far. I want to send out our kids and our youth with your teachers and classes. You can go right out the back. Let's thank God for them as they go. And uh, one other thing, if you are in the room or online, please share the service on Facebook. I am amazed at how God uses shares to reach people. So there's something about sharing that is biblical, even on Facebook. It's pretty beautiful. Uh, and one last word about Rooted. Let us know, ASAP, if you're going to join one of those groups, groups at caneochurch.com, uh, or just message it if you're out there on Facebook so Julie Foster can get you in a group. Amen. Amen. So how many of you here were here for last week? to greet and experience Bishop Huggins. Was he a blast or what? So I, I have to pass on to you. He felt so welcome. He, he said like three or four times, like the hospitality of your people is phenomenal. He just felt like family when he was among you guys. So wow, what a, it, and what a, what a great friend he is becoming. And uh, if, if you missed last week's service, please catch up. Um, it was not a regular old service. Uh, it was quite inspiring and beautiful. And so please uh, go and find it on Vimeo or Spotify or uh, Apple Podcast or Facebook. Or I could go on and on. But anyway, you can find it. If you just want to find it, you can find it. Easy. Uh, and do you know why last week was so good? Do you know, I'll tell you, I'm glad you're asking. So, because what he shared was full of grace and love and forgiveness, and what he shared was also very true and biblical, and he shared challenge from God's word, and he found a balance that we're going to be talking about today of grace and truth at the same time. He said some hard things to us with a tear in his eyes rather than a finger in our face. Amen. There's something about that where the heart of God comes through with grace and truth at the same darn time. So those two, grace and truth, have been a little hard to come by this last year. And, and I feel like this last year would have been very different for most of our lives and for our country if grace was practiced more and if we actually knew what the truth was. Like, it got really dicey this last year with on both of those fronts. It got really strange. And here's why. Because as he, how many of you are human beings? Would you raise your hand? So, <laughs> some of you didn't raise your hand. I'm really worried. But... We usually gravitate towards one or the other. And it could be part of your personality, it could be part of your upbringing, it could be just the season that you're in. But usually we go one way or the other with this thing. And under stress, especially, like you might, if you're a truthy person, you may get more aggressive with truth. If you're a gracie person, you may just check totally out. These things get turned up to 11 when we're under stress. 
But under normal conditions, we still had one way or the other. Some of you may lean more towards gray. And other people may, may look at you and say, you know, you're too nice. Or they may bust your chops and say, you just lack conviction, man. You should be more courageous. Some of you lean more towards truth. Now, we need truth. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life, right? So we don't avoid truth. We need truth. But there are some people who, are, who proclaim themselves as, well, I'm just a truth teller. Some of you are shaking your heads already. Yeah, sometimes that's used as an excuse to be a pain to everyone around them. Can I get an amen? Okay. Some of you are looking at your spouse like, I better not say amen right now. So, but we don't have to choose one or the other. You don't have to be grace or truth. And let me prove it to you. So, Jesus had a best friend on earth named John. John wrote some words about Jesus Christ in John chapter 1, and I want to share those with you. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. How many of you heard this verse before, right? And then it says, We've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, and look at this, full of grace and truth. John could have picked thousands of words to describe Jesus. He chose these two because he saw them as very, very foundational to who Jesus was and what he came to do. I think he also chose these words because they are a challenge and a reminder to each of us as Jesus people to be more like Jesus. Do you know what Christian means? Christ won. It was actually a derogatory term given in Antioch to one of the first churches, and they called them little Christ ones, those Christians over there. But if we are Jesus ones, we want to model our lives after him. We want to be people of grace and truth. We need to have both of these in our lives. So Jesus was full throttle grace. Like the word uh, full in, in Greek means to be complete, to be mature, or to be totally covered in something. He was clothed in grace. He was also full throttle truth. There are times when you read the words of Jesus and you're like, whoa, boom, right? Drop the mic. Like that, what he did was something else right there. He did not have to choose one or the other and neither do we. So let me digress for just a minute. I'm going to have some fun. Think about what is your favorite car. If money was no object, what would you drive? What would you have driven to church and parked right up there on the curb and everybody drives by and goes like, what? So Len said 68 Chevelle, is that right? An SS 396. That's a nice car, Len. So on the count of three, I want, just think about your car. What is your car or SUV or whatever it is? Okay, camper van, I don't know what it is. Uh, and then on the count of three, you're going to say it out loud. You on Facebook as well, on the count of three, you're going to say it out loud, your favorite car. One, two, three, four GT. So a VW van, a 64. Do you know how much they're worth with the windows on top? They're like $100,000. Okay, so this is my car. My dream car, it's not really my car. So this is a Ford GT, and um, it only costs about a half a million dollars, and it only has 647 horsepower. Um, it's a rocket ship. Did you ever see Ford versus Ferrari? Good movie. Anyway, so, anyway, so, this is called a GT, and I did a little research on what does GT even mean? Because you see it out there. So the, the Italians, Gran Turismo, the Americans call it Grand Touring. What it means is a car that has a whole bunch of power and can go a really long distance. It has power. It has patience. It's really fast. It's also fairly comfortable. 
So GT to me reminds me of Grace Truth. So if you see me driving this, you'll know why. And you'll also know that I got a second job somehow. <laughs> now, I asked the bishop this last week, I said, tell me about grace and truth. What, what do these words mean to you? And, and he laid this on me. He said, grace without truth is compromise. And he said, truth without grace is condemnation. And then he said, grace and truth together is conviction. That might preach right there, right? That's pretty good. I'm going to be reaching out to him every week, man, that guy. So uh, let me show you an amazing example of the two working together in the life of Christ. So if you have a Bible, go to John 8, and we're going to start in verse 2. You can do this on your phone, too. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. Now, just pause there. Where's the guy? Doesn't it take two people to do this little sin here? Okay, interesting. Verse 4, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Right? And then in parentheses, they were using this as a trap because they wanted a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. They kept on questioning him. So he straightened up, and he said, Let any one of you who is without sin... Be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he went back down and he wrote in the ground, in the sand, just wrote something. We don't know what it is for sure. I have a couple guesses. And then it says that those who began to, uh, those who stood around as they heard him, they started to walk away one at a time, starting with the older ones first. And then Jesus stood up and said, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, sir. Look at his words. Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. So we see a stunning example of grace because Jesus could have given into the peer pressure and said, yep, she deserves death. I got to maintain my ministry here with all these people. They got to respect me, so I guess go ahead and stone her. They wouldn't have thought any worse of him. It would have been easier on his ministry career for her to die. He also could have played just the grace card and said, come on, lady, let's run and get out of here. Right? He could have, like, he, he could have played some, some other deal. But notice what he did. His grace kept her alive. He stood up for her in a really remarkable way. He saw the individual, not the sin. He saw the person. He understood the situation. He understood that these guys had, were trying to trap him, were trying to get rid of her. They saw her as an object, not as a human. They didn't care if she lived or died. He did. And then notice his truth. His truth set her on the right track. He said, go and leave your life of sin. He didn't say, hey, no big deal. I'm glad that we had this little meeting. You know, have a good week. He said, go leave your life because it's wrong. And the conviction of the grace and the truth together made her own her situation and say, whoa, I just dodged a bullet. Like, God just saved me. And she left different. Not because of one, not because of the other, because they functioned together. It changed everything for her. So what was Jesus writing in the sand? Have, how many of you have wondered this, right? So you may have heard uh, different speculation. Some people would say the Ten Commandments, that Jesus was writing down, and then these guys were looking over, and they're like, ooh, I did that one. I'm out of here. 
Some people would say that he wrote the names of all the people standing in the group, and then they looked over and they're like, ooh, Josephus, shoot, he knows my background, I'm out of here. There's another interesting suggestion that Jesus was fulfilling a prophecy from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, 13 says, Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Jesus called himself living water one chapter before this. And it may be that he was writing down the words of this prophecy that they would all know about judgment coming against those that are not doing God's will. And that conviction came over them for fingering this lady. And then they were like, wait a minute, I do not want to be on the wrong side of Jeremiah. And they started walking away. Could be the Holy Spirit working in the lives of some pretty dark individuals. But notice the result is her life was saved and set on a different path. And we have this beautiful story captured by John to say we ought to be more like this. When somebody, is, when somebody accuses someone in front of you, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, yeah, you're right, they're a big fat jerk? Or are you going to say, well, wait a minute, this is a human being created in the image of God. It's not cool to talk about them like that. Let's, let's figure out another solution rather than agreeing or ignoring. Let's have grace and truth. It seems like the religious leaders in the Bible, though, doesn't it seem that they always choose truth and never grace? It scares me that in my own reading of Scripture, I always put myself on the good team. I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah, I would never be like that. I, you know, no, I'm far too mature, far too godly to be like them. But it seems like sometimes, you guys, as evangelical Christians, we look more like the Pharisees than we would like to admit. And our culture looks at us and goes, there, there's a dissonance because we don't have enough grace or we have too much grace, we don't even speak the truth anymore. We've got to find this balance. We've got to find it. Very important for our culture. And Jesus actually talked about why they did not show grace. So Luke 7, there's a little situation that happens for Jesus. A lady comes in and anoints his feet. And the Pharisees judge her and judge him and judge everything. And then they say, why would you do that? And then Jesus says, whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And he says the real issue is, where's love come from? Do you understand the level of your forgiveness? If we understand the level of our forgiveness, it changes everything. If we understand how much we have been forgiven, we will be quick to show grace, quick to show love, and slow to judge because we understand that someone else did not judge us, right? But if we think we're pretty good on all, all on our own, like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm all that. I, I got it together. I'm, I'm a pretty good guy. We fall into the trap of self-righteousness, which is totally different than God-righteousness. God-righteousness is, I am a screw-up saved by grace. Self-righteousness is, I'm pretty good, and God helps me be better. That is a recipe for disaster. It's actually, the road to hell is paved with that kind of thinking. The Pharisees were stuck in self-righteous thought. Condemnation does not accept responsibility, it just points fingers. It doesn't say, I'm a mess, it says, you are a mess. So here's the thing, here's the balance. Two big thoughts for us today. You and I are far worse than we can imagine. Now some of you are like, I know, right? Some of you, like, I don't have to convince you. But here's the second part. We are far more loved than we would ever dare to hope. So we hold both, I am the scum of the earth and a child of the king. Wait a minute. Usually we grab one or the other, and then we have to go see our psychologist to figure out how to get out of this mess, right? We have to hold both of these in our hands. They're both true. You have been redeemed because you are a mess. 
And you've been redeemed because you're precious to your Father in heaven. And so are others. And so if I understand not just that they're a screw-up and a worm, but they're also loved like I am, I'm going to treat them differently. But if I say I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you, I'm more this or that than you, that's a lot of selfishness happening. That's not a lot of grace and godliness happening. So if we can understand the truth about our condition before God, truth, grace comes out of it. So truth is not just how I treat you. It's truth is how do I see me? If the truth of God's word and the truth of the conviction of his Holy Spirit settles in here, I'm like, oh man, I am not all that without his help. And I'm going to show grace to somebody else. They travel together. But if we miss that, we don't see ourselves accurately. We don't see our world accurately. We don't see our family, our friends. We don't see anything accurately. So this is actually an ancient problem. This is not 2020 that this came on the scene in, in our world. Tertullian, have you heard this name before? He was called the Hammer of Heretics. How's that for a business card? So in, in, the, in the year 200 um, in Carthage, he was writing about Jesus was crucified on the cross between two thieves. The gospel is crucified these days in the year 200 between two thieves, and he called them moralism and relativism. 1,800 and something years ago, he's saying, you know, we have a problem in our human nature. Either we think, if I just do it all right, I've earned God's favor, or I can do whatever I want because I already have God's favor. They're both giant errors that actually steal joy and peace and meaning right out of the gospel because they don't deal with sin. And, and if our salvation is earned by us or it's cheap because everybody gets it, then the joy and the freedom and the release and the wow of the cross makes no sense. It's stripped away because it's all about my effort or it's all about I don't got to do anything. But the picture that we have in salvation is I got to do something. I got to say, yes, please, I need you. Not because I earned it and not because I'm just a human being and we all get it and I don't have to. No, we have to understand God's grace and the truth of his grace is we need him. We can't make it on our own. So let's fast forward 2,000 years. Timothy Keller, maybe you've heard of him, says the same thing about two thieves. And he doesn't give Tertullian any credit. So he says, legalism is truth without grace. And license is grace without truth. And then he said these words, I really, I really like this. Um, Love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us, but keeps us in denial about our flaws. So for all grace, we don't even look at the messed up parts of ourselves. But we need to look at the messed up parts of ourselves because it's true, right? And then he says, truth without love is harshness. It gives us information, okay? But it's in such a way that we can't hear it. Have you ever had somebody criticize you and you couldn't receive it? It was like what they were saying was kind of true, but you're like, "Mm, not listening to you because the manner in which it came was harsh. The, the, uh, your relationship with them was not deep enough. You didn't have enough trust to receive this thing that was coming. That's the harshness. That's the truth without grace. So just a little thing I was thinking about this week. I've been a pastor for almost 30 years. I've known a lot of people. I've never met a person that I couldn't criticize. Right? Right? I mean, except, except you guys. <laughs> but, but I've also learned that my criticism of someone else has never really helped. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't speak the truth in love to somebody. But it does mean that a critical spirit 
a I'm right, you're wrong, that is a mess. That's a recipe that our enemy uses to short circuit our relationships. So if you criticize people regularly, ask a couple of them how it's going and see what they say and learn from that. So this, it's not about being perfect. It is about learning and growing and becoming more like Jesus. So I want to share with you guys a, uh, a little diagram, and we're going to call it the Grace and Truth Matrix. And so we have high grace, which we are shooting for, and we have high truth, which we are shooting for, and then we have the bad stuff, right? So if we are looking at Jesus, he is going to be high grace and high truth, correct? So here is our model that we are aiming for in our lives. So you, can you guys see this over there? So think about where you might be on this chart. We are all very different people. I look around and I know some of your styles, you are all over the map, literally, and that's okay. But we need to be heading in a trajectory towards him. The Holy Spirit wants to work in each of us to make us more like Jesus. So this is our direction, and this is to empower people. If we have grace and truth, our goal is reconciliation, it's empowerment, it's love, it's I want what's best for Jeremy. It actually, if what's best for Jeremy is not what's best for me, I still want it. And, and I don't have to prove Jeremy wrong to feel better. That's how we get in these weird situations. Now, what's interesting up here, is this is just like flattery. So if I am all about grace and there's not a lot of truth, I'm just nice to everybody just to be nice to everybody. And that doesn't really, it can actually be counterproductive because I can tell somebody they're awesome and they're not, right? I can, I can say things that are not, true because I'm not really worried about that. And, and over here, we have our bishop's word. This is where we condemn people who are made in the likeness of God our Father. Not my job to condemn. There is one judge, and it's not you. Some of you guys needed to hear that. So, the other thing here is if I'm low truth and low grace, what's that? I don't even care, right? So this, this is apathy. This is kind of the worst thing. But there are some people that are inactive and apathetic and stuck and frozen, even by this last year, the events of all it. And sometimes depression gets you stuck in this place where you're like, I don't worry about grace and truth right now, I just got to survive. But I think this, for just kind of find yourself on this chart somewhere and say, Lord, help me to be more like you. Because the Lord has a plan to use each of us as the parts of his body for his glory. Some parts are mouth parts. We speak more into people's lives. Some are more service parts, and you're doing stuff behind the scenes and whatever, but there's got to be this balance of grace and truth for each of us, for each of you. So I want to ask the band to come up as we, as we wrap this up. So just a couple of real practical things. Speaking the truth needs to happen. Think about a time in your life when somebody spoke truth into your life in such a way that you could receive it. Now, here's a tool that I want to give you. No charge for this. this. is a free tool. There have been times when people have spoken truth into my life this last year, and I did not hear it. Uh, what I heard was, <laughs> and so I went back to those people and I said, next time, please deliver the package this way. 
We can do that in our relationships. You can say, here is how I like to receive helpful feedback, creative criticism. Please give it to me like this. And we can, we can play that card. Here's another one. Know when to speak into somebody's life and when to zip it. There have been all kinds of opportunities on social media to prove somebody wrong. And, and God's wisdom is often zip it because they're not listening and then other people are going to watch your fight with this person and they go, oh, I knew it. Christians can't even get along. There's something about this where we can call the person, we can reach out to the person, you can private message the person, you can say, let's get together, you can talk about stuff. And, and you can say, help me understand, rather than you're wrong and I'm going to prove it. You're wrong and I'm going to prove it never turns out right. I mean, I can't think of any example in my life where I went after somebody to prove myself right and it turned out okay. So here's the other thing. The God's Word says to remove the plank from my eye before I help you with the speck in yours. Do you remember the two big points on the screen? If we understand what screw-ups we actually are, it, it helps us look at other people with grace and understanding and say, you know, I have my issues. And here's the thing. Often the thing that you fear most, the thing that you struggle with the most, is the thing you attack most in others. You can go smoke that later and figure that out. That is, that is a, heavy, a heavy thought. Did I say that out loud? Okay. And here, here's the last one, the last test for each of us. When do you show grace? When do you show truth? When do you show grace? When do you value truth? Always, both. So if you have to choose, don't. If you say, well, now is the opportunity for truth and not, no. Well, now is just when I'm going to show this and not, no. Back the train up and say, okay, Lord, help me to have both in this situation. And he will. So as a church, we are going to be heading in this direction for 2021 and forever to become all grace and all truth and not holding back on either of those. And that will be challenging at times, and it will be hard, and it will be beautiful and right. As an individual, and you can start playing. So, as an individual, ask the Lord right now, what are you saying to me? Right now, Denise, Tom, like, like for your life, Holy Spirit, where do you want me to work? Where do you want to work in me? What do you want me to pay attention to? Where am I, where am I have a deficit? Do I have a grace deficit? Do I have a truth deficit? And ask the Lord right now to make up that gap because he wants to, because he's capable of it, because you are capable of containing both as a Jesus person filled by his Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I ask right now for people here in this room, for people outside, for people out watching, that you would fill up em empty tanks of grace where maybe we feel like, man, I got nothing left. I was so, I, I was drained by being nice to people and, and giving, and I got nothing left. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would fill up those empty tanks, that we would be graceful people. And I ask, Lord, for some of us that have struggled with, I don't even know what the truth is, that, Lord, we would find our truth to be you and your word, the consistency of who you are. And, Lord, that we wouldn't have to find our truth out in the news or in social media or we would find it in you. We would be secure in the truth that you provide. And, Lord, help us to be people that are truthful, not people of lies, not people of half-truths, not people of convenience, not people who get by, but people who say it like it is and still with love. So, Lord, fill up the truth deficit in us. And if there's, there are lies in us, clean them out. Things we believe about ourselves, people, uh, things, things that we have learned that are not true, Lord, wipe them out. Help us to be discerning about what we hear, what we read, what we see. 
And help us, Lord, to be people that are used by you to speak truth and love into the lives around us. So people don't avoid us, people seek us out because they want you. Jesus, have your way in Caneo Church. Jesus, have your way in our lives. And use our lives to draw others to you. This year and way beyond. Thank you, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Now, we are going to celebrate what we've just... I'm going to let you talk about that. Go ahead and stand up, everybody, and Annie's going to lead us in this final song. For all our differences and personalities and tendencies, um, we have plenty in common. Uh, our testimonies have a lot in common. Sinners saved by grace, loved, made in the image of God, loved by Him. And so I want us to just celebrate our testimony today. And Aaliyah is going to lead us in that. So here we go. <laughs> darkness run for cover but the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power still the miracle that I just can't get registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. My Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. and washed in water sing the praises of the spirit son and father our god will finish what he started yes our god will finish what he started this is my testimony from death to life as grace rewrote my story i'll testify Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify my Jesus Christ the righteous I'll justify this is my testimony oh I'm alive this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my
about that those words this is my testimony from death to life do you feel alive hopefully you do but we've been through quite a year so there may be some barriers keeping you from actually feeling alive and feeling like that song is true in your life right now just get real and say lord i want to be that I want to be totally alive in you. Would you clean out the gunk from this last year and allow me to be totally alive in you? And if you are out there and you're watching this and you feel like there's some residue from this last year, just say, Lord, would you clean me and make me just alive so that others can see your life in me? Amen? Now, how about a benediction, everybody? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you, everybody.